Hey guys, tonight we're going to talk about liver failure and cirrhosis. So this is one of my other favorite topics. This is probably, I think, one of the hardest things for a patient to have to go through. Um, and there's so many things that the liver does that most people don't realize. Um, but, um, you know, as hard as it is, um, I think it's a very interesting process because when you realize just how much the liver does for you, you can see what happens when that stops working. <clears throat> Excuse me. So first, let's start out by talking about liver patient signs and symptoms. So this is literally like a picture of everything that can happen to a liver patient. Look at how much it's affected. They can have neurological changes. They can have gastrointestinal changes, um, changes to their kidneys, changes to their endocrine system, their immune system changes, cardiovascular systems affected, their lungs are affected, their blood, they can have blood disorders, they can have skin changes, fluid and electrolyte imbalances tons of stuff. So we're going to kind of break this down of the big ones because I could go on for hours about all the things the liver does. But let's talk about when a liver patient comes to the hospital, they're in the critical care unit, what do they look like? What problems are they having? And what are we going to do about them? So the way that I kind of remember the basics of what a liver patient looks like is that they're yellow, confused and bruised, their volume overloaded, bloated, but their belly is not loaded. And so this will make more sense. You know how I like to rhyme and have things that sound really good together. So um, as a whole, this is going to just kind of break down and we're going to go step by step with each of these and explain why they're like this and what we're going to do about it. So first of all, the patient is yellow. And why are they yellow? They, uh, why are they yellow? Because they're yellow because they are not properly excreting bilirubin. And increased bilirubin levels in the blood leads to what we call jaundice. So we can see jaundice in a few different places. We can see it in the eyes. We can see it on the skin, on the stomach, in the mucous membranes. And sometimes it's going to depend on the skin tone of the patient as to um, what you call it, where we're going to best see that. But looking in all those places for that coloration is going to um, be very helpful. Additionally, increased bilirubin also leads to itchy skin. So a lot of times these patients, they have a lot of really bad itching and you'll notice on their arms and stuff like that, that they'll have like a lot of scabs and that's because they have itchy skin, they're scratching it and they have, um, you know, like little um, uh, sores and stuff that they're developing on their skin. Um, and then um, they have trouble healing and they have trouble with bleeding, which we'll talk about. And so they don't heal very easily. So additionally, the patient is confused. So we got the yellow, now we're getting confused. Um, we can, hopefully not, we're, we're not getting confused, but the patient is gonna be getting confused. So confusion happens because there's a buildup of ammonia or waste products. So think about like with the kidneys, how the kidneys excrete, you know, uh, we cut a lot, um, all of your waste, you know, that's one of its main jobs. So is the liver. The liver is also in charge. It's one of your other filters. And one of the things that, um, the most common things that builds up that leads to the confusion is a ammonia. Usually the liver is in charge of breaking down proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. And normally in a healthy liver, like in this picture, ammonia gets changed to urea and gets um, uh, like, you know, getting, it gets, uh, the body gets rid of it through the kidneys um, or the gut. But in liver failure, ammonia goes to the liver to get um, converted, but that conversion doesn't happen. And because of that, they accumulate that and that leads to a brain toxicity. And when a patient builds up a ammonia, uh, what do you call it, um, in the body, pretty much the, um, the mind gets very overwhelmed and it leads to literally like, you know, confusion, decreased level of consciousness, um, very significant mental changes. And this is usually how the person can presents to the hospital. So they present very confused, altered mental status. Um, there's something that's definitely not working or not right. And you can tell that. And usually their ammonia levels are going to come back elevated. Um, so we need to do really close neurological assessments. They're also bruised. So a lot of people don't know this. Remember when we talked about in um, kidney failure about how they secrete EPO or erythropoietin, which helps stimulate the bone marrow to make um, red blood cells. Well, the liver is in charge of stimulating a different hormone that tells the bone marrow to make platelets. So, um, and on top of that, the liver is also a big component of the coagulation cascade. Vitamins that you need for clotting are made in the liver as well. And so the, the liver plays a huge role in clotting. Um, and so again, if you, um, if you kind of don't remember a lot about platelets and stuff like that in clotting, um, if your blood is not clotting, then you're gonna bleed. So these patients are literally a natural anticoagulant. These patients, when they come to the hospital, they don't need DVT prophylaxis because they are a natural DVT prophylaxis because they are already have 
um, very, very um, uh, higher chance of bleeding. Like they are not clotting whatsoever. They have a very low chance of clotting um, because of that. Like when we check this patient's like um, INR, it's therapeutic and sometimes higher. Sometimes it's, it's actually like off the charts. And so that's one of the things to keep in mind with these patients is that they're gonna be really high chance of bleeding. So I have to be really careful. And that's what, remember I talked about all those scabs from the itching on the skin, they can break down their skin and end up bleeding a whole lot and get a, like a lot of breakdown. But they're going to be more likely to bruise. And then anytime I'm doing anything with them, I have to be super careful to make sure that they don't excessively bleed. They're also volume overloaded and bloated. And what does that mean? That means that, um, what do you call it, effectively they get the ascites and peripheral edema. They have too much volume, but here's the thing about it. Because remember we talked about, you know, um, you know, when a, a lot of, we've talked about a lot of different disorders where a patient has too much volume. A patient that has liver failure, um, we call it the difference in their volume overload is they have tons of volume, but it's not in their bloodstream. It's in the wrong place. They are third spacing. All the fluid that's supposed to be in their blood uh, vessels is getting sent out into the tissues. And so they get peripheral edema. They get that big pregnant looking like belly that we call ascites. And that's because the liver is responsible for making plasma proteins. And if you don't remember a lot about plasma proteins, think Think of them, and especially we usually talk about albumin when we're talking about these, their job is to kind of be the cool proteins and to hang out in the blood. And when they're hanging out in the blood, fluid and other particles hang out with them because they want to be around those plasma proteins. But if I don't have those plasma proteins, then fluid's like, hey, I'm not hanging out here. There's no plasma proteins around. I'm leaving. And they go out into the tissue. So in other words, we need plasma proteins to keep fluid where it's supposed to be. Um, and so in liver patients, fluid goes where it's not so supposed to be. And so these patients, even though they're volume overloaded, they got tons of fluid on their lungs, on their belly, on their legs, they actually are usually hypotensive because they have no volume in their blood vessels. It's all in the wrong place. Um, so it's a very, very hard balance with these patients because they do not have fluid in the right place. So then also the stomach not loaded. So that's the last um, part of my little um, rhyme there. So these patients can have, um, you know, gastrointestinal upset, like nausea, vomiting, decreased appetite. Some of this can be because of their alcohol use, which is usually the cause of their liver, liver failure or cirrhosis. Um, but also it can be from the pressure from the ascites. So, you know, if anyone's watching this has ever been pregnant before, it's kind of like when you get to your last trimester and um, everything pushes up on your abdomen, you just have no appetite because there's literally just not a lot of space for your stomach. Um, and so it's the same with that big ascites belly. You know, a lot of times that um, just causes the patients to not be even hungry at all. And then additionally to that, they're building up waste products, which can cause that nausea vomiting. Um, they are at a high, high, high risk of malnutrition because I also brought up the fact before that the liver is responsible for making plasma, uh, sorry, uh, vitamins and minerals um, that are going to help support your nutrition. And so they're already not taking in what they need. They're not making what they need. Um, and so this patient is going to have a lot of risk for complications because they're not getting the nourishment they need. So um, another consideration is that um, there is what's called the portal vein system. Um, and um, that's the system, if you can see it in this picture, um, that pretty much runs through the gastrointestinal system. So you can see where it's attached to everything. It's attached. This is like the blood vessel system um, that's uh, all throughout your gastrointestinal system. Um, it goes up into your liver. It goes up into your um, stomach, your esophagus. And when this isn't working, what happens is that um, uh, we call it a uh, pressure is going to build up from the liver and you're going to get what's called portal hypertension. And when that backs up, it builds like a backflow of pressure, which goes actually up into the esophagus and patients can um, build up what we call esophageal varices, which effectively think Think about like those varicose veins that, you know, um, you know, men or women can get in their legs, those big torturous veins on their legs, but in your esophagus. And these are really sensitive. And remember, don't forget, like this patient's really high risk of bleeding already. But if I get these esophageal varices from extra pressure from this portal hypertension that can happen when my liver's not functioning, then what happens is that I have these like very sensitive, um, easily, uh, easy to rupture blood vessels in my esophagus. And what goes in my esophagus? 
esophagus food. So I get a potato chip, it gets down in, um, down in my esophagus, cuts one of those um, varices open. And yes, this is how this happens. French fries, potato chips, simple foods, anything can irritate them. They burst and you start massively bleeding. Um, and so this is another reason that uh, the liver failure patients will come in because of GI bleeding. Mm -hmm. So um, GI bleeding, this is kind of an example to show you here what this looks like, but you see this big torturous vessel over here. Um, this is going to be where um, they have a lot of the problems. Uh, what do you call it? If a chip, uh, we call it random food, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be a potato chip. Don't be looking on your test questions for potato chips, but you get the point. Something goes down into the esophagus because I'm going to eat something or I'm going to be drinking alcohol, something like that. And it irritates those vessels and they rupture. Um, so the signs and symptoms are going to be like bright red blood because this is um, something that's active. It's right there in their esophagus. So usually they're going to vomit up bright red blood. They can also have dark black or tarry stools. Um, they're going to diagnose it and treat it through an endoscopy where they're going to go down in. they're going to look, and then they're going to fix the bleeding. If I'm actively bleeding, they can put literally like a rubber band around these blood vessels and get them to stop. Um, they can cauterize them or burn off where they're bleeding to stop that bleeding. They can also clip them. Um, put little clips on them so that they're no longer bleeding. Um, we also give medications like octreotide, which helps stop bleeding from these esophageal varices, and pantoprazole, which if you remember, that's a proton pump inhibitor, and that's going to stop the gastric acid secretion, which is going to help because we don't want anything else irritating these blood vessels. We also, for in general, for um, portal hypertension, there is a procedure that can be done. It's not something that most people qualify for, but it's what's called a TIPS, um, and it effectively helps to to reduce that portal hypertension so you're less likely to form these varices. Another consideration is drug metabolism in these patients. So drugs ride on plasma proteins in the blood and then they're metabolized by the liver and released into the body system. But when there's less plasma proteins and the liver's already not doing its job, drugs are not gonna have their ride and they're gonna just be floating around. They're free floating. So instead of like, you know, kind of a process where it's like a slow release, um, like where you slowly get to experience something. So kind of think of like, if you're a fan, if you've ever eaten gobstoppers, like how like you have to, like there's like that um, sweet, uh, like it's kind of sour on the outside and gets into that sweet crunchy core. Like it takes a while, you have to kind of break down to get to that core. And that's how most medications when they get in our body are. We don't just get it like, here's your medication. You know, when we swallow medications, they have to be broken down, processed, and then they have to travel to wherever they're supposed to go to um, in order to start working. And so, but when the liver's not working, that process gets stopped. They don't have that like slow unveiling process where they're going to um, get to like slowly be released into the blood. Um, these medications are just like, kind of like, well, sorry, we don't have any safety protocols in place. Here you go. So it's kind of like biting right into the center of that gobstopper. There's nothing on the outside. Um, and so, so um, it, it makes, it means that your body is going to have more effects and you're going to experience full effects of the medication and it's going to last longer because there's no one regulating um, those medications and how much that you're absorbing and over what period of time. So in other words, you need to watch these patients because any medication you give them is going to hit them harder. And then also they might feel the effects for a longer period of time because they don't have that filtration that they used to have when their liver was functioning. So when that ammonia builds up, there's a special name that we have for this. Um, it's what we call hepatic encephalopathy. And that's when ammonia and other wastes build up and they create an actual toxicity. And that's why I said we have that decreased level of consciousness, confusion, agitation, restlessness. They can have coma and even death. Um, this can be a medical emergency. So what are we going to do for these patients? So our overall management of these patients is we want to keep the patients safe. Like I mentioned, they're going to be a huge safety risk. They're going to be confused um, and you'll have a lot going on and not really understand what's happening. They also could be withdrawing from alcohol. So we want to keep them safe and we might have to use restraints or other things as a last, um, uh, as a last measure if needed, but they're going to need close monitoring and watching to prevent falls and other injury. Because if they fall, remember, they're also going to bleed a whole lot. Um, we also want to monitor in general for signs and symptoms of bleeding, um, be looking for signs of bleeding externally, of course, and then also internally, drops in hemoglobin, m like even more significant de uh, decreases in blood pressure, increased heart rate, any sign that they might be bleeding inside. 
Um, you know, we, like I mentioned, we want to mention, uh, monitor their vital signs because they're usually going to have low blood pressure, support their nutrition, uh, monitor their neurological status. So do regular assessments. We really need to teach them about stopping drinking because that's going to be one of the most important education that we can give them and avoiding things that will exacerbate their liver problems. So um, anything like, think, remember like acetaminophen and things that are hard on the liver, we really want to avoid those kind of medications because they're going to make it worse. So there's um, a variety of medications we can give for the liver, but the, some of the most common ones that you're going to see is what's called um, lact lactulose. And this is a medication that, you know, uh, I always joke that, you know, some patients, because they they're still a little bit drunk when they come into you, is that they'll be like, oh yeah, give me that lactulose. It's like a sweet cocktail. And it's really not, it doesn't taste good. It's really sweet, but it, it doesn't taste like a cocktail for sure. Um, but it, it, effectively what it's going to do is going to help get rid of excess ammonia. So both lactulose and rifaximin, both of these work um, and they go in the gut and um, you, you take them orally, you can actually give lactulose by enema too, which is not fun, but it, it can be given if needed, if they can't take things by mouth, because remember, they're going to be more confused and decrease level of consciousness. So um, this patient um, that's on lactulose or rifaximin, pretty much what it's going to do is it's going to grab all of the ammonia that's in the gut and poop it out. So it's not the way you want to get rid of it, but this is what happens. And so like, I mean, I'll have orders to give lactulose until awake. Like I have to keep giving this and giving this enema, enema, enema. And like sometimes every hour, every two hours until the patient wakes up. Cause that's how severe their ammonia levels are that I need to get that ammonia out because I can't even get them to wake up. Um, we're also going to give systemic antibiotics for a lot of these patients. They're going to be really high risk for what's called SBP, not systolic blood pressure, but spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Um, so because of the ascites and a lot of the other issues they have and the, gast uh, the varices, they're really high risk for this. So a lot of times we do prophylactic antibiotics with these patients because they're so high risk. Um, and then albumin, like they're missing that plasma protein. So we may need to give that back to them to get the fluid back to where it belongs. Hmm. So other treatments and priorities, we might do a paracentesis or a thoracentesis. Most of the time you think paracentesis because they got the ascites, but remember also patients with um, liver issues are high risk of getting a pleural effusion. Um, so they may need a thoracentesis as well. And they take a ton of fluid off of this for the paracentesis. For the thoracentesis, they only take a liter or so. For the paracentesis, I think the most I've seen taken off is 33 liters of fluid off someone's belly. Um, so yeah, they can hold a ton of fluid in the wrong places. Uh, we want to do neurological support, maintain their safety, frequent neuro checks. Um, skin protection is going to be important because these patients are decreased level of consciousness, confused, they may not be awake. And they're also having frequent BMs because they're medication. So high risk for breakdown, fluid and electrolyte imbalances. So I need to watch those closely. Um, we use what's called the CWA protocol, um, which is a um, scale to kind of see if someone's withdrawing from alcohol. And so we're going to monitor that closely um, just to kind of see what, um, how they're doing and then treat them because um, alcohol withdrawal may not seem like not a big deal. Like, hey, they just need a couple days and they'll be okay. But patients can die and go into cardiac arrest from alcohol withdrawal. So you have to be super careful with these patients, monitor them frequently and closely and really be looking out for those signs that um, they're uh, um, uh, we got starting to go into the delirium tremens or withdrawing. Uh, and then fluid and electro, oh, and I, I'll mention one more thing is that, um, you know, most time patients, they start withdrawing about two days after they've been in the hospital. So that's always like the first question I want to ask when I'm taking care of a patient who has a, a heavy alcohol use and they just came to the hospital, when do they come in? Because if it's two days, that um, 48 hours is usually when they're most at risk for um, withdrawing from the alcohol. Um, and then fluid and electrolyte balances, like I mentioned, you know, they're going to have frequent BMs. If you remember, we poop potassium. And so um, if they're pooping a whole lot from the lactulose, they can have fluid and electrolyte imbalances. And remember, they're also not getting the nutrients they need. So watching that fluid and electrolyte balance, supporting their breathing, um, making sure that they um, have their ABCs and making sure that they um, are getting the perfusion they need as well. So this is just kind of a basic rundown. Like I said, I could talk for a while about liver problems because there's so much that can happen, but hopefully this gets you started um, to, you know, what is liver failure and how can I help this patient? What are they going to look like? So hope this was helpful. See you next time.